Uh, very honored to have Rick Hanischek speak to us today. Uh, could be more honored, quite frankly. Education, what more could we want? Okay, what could we hope for? We're all in the same business. It's called the exceptional results of sensible teacher salary reforms. Take it away. Thanks very much. I was um, I was going to bring in a prop. I have a prop that suggests that the reforms that we're talking about that has a copyright of 1962. <laughs> it's just that we don't get those reforms. Um, uh, <clears throat> what I want to do today is talk uh, mostly about work that we've done in Dallas, Texas. Dallas has gotten very little attention for the fact that it has completely changed the way it hires and pays and evaluates teachers. Dallas um, has for now close to 10 years been working on a set of school reforms that turn out, as I will demonstrate, to be pretty powerful in terms of results. Um, and then you say, well, which of the other 13,500 school districts in the country have adopted what Dallas has, has done? And you find that not very many. Um, and so that's one of the puzzles at the end. But what I want to talk about is <clears throat> what Dallas has been able to do. I have to warn you that occasionally I may break into spontaneous sneezing and coughing. Um, it is um, comes with two negative COVID tests. So it's just an old cold that I might be uh, having here. False positive. <laughs> False negative. Um, I, I'm going to take a little bit of a, a moment that is tangentially related to this discussion. Um, and I take the moment because I've been unable to convince very many people that the current situation in education is really desperate uh, in many ways. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the pandemic and um, what's going on in schools today and then uh, turn to Dallas and then come back a little bit to what that implies for the pandemic. Um, the uh, Dallas situation is a complete change in how they pay and hire teachers. And then they applied some of the things they learned from which teachers were good and which weren't to induce some of the better teachers to go into some of the worst schools in Dallas. Uh, and it turns out that that works. Um, and so that's uh, the, the full story. Um, let me talk a little bit, uh, sort of an aside, just to motivate this. Um, I don't have to tell people here that, that skills um, and income go together. Um, what in, in the United States, if I compare what is the return to skills uh, as measured by just standard math achievement tests or something like that, um, and think of a Mincer earnings equation with measures of what people know as opposed to how many years of schooling they have. This shows us returns across the world. It comes from a OECD survey that gave um, a survey instruments to a random selection of the adult population in 30 some countries and also gave them math and reading tests uh, at the same time. So from that, you can look around the world. And what you see is that the United States rewards skills more than every other country in the initial survey. There have been a couple of recent surveys, uh, additions to the survey that suggest that maybe Singapore has higher rewards than the US. But what this says is that uh, the US labor market really pays attention to the quality of workers. 
read backwards because of the pandemic, it says that the US punishes the lack of skills more than any other country in the world. Um, and so if you take what we know about the pandemic, um, uh, well, let me first go with the, the part that um, is more controversial when I speak to all my macroeconomic colleagues is that um, skills of the population also seem to be very closely related to long run growth rates uh, around the world. And that the pandemic means that the US um, will have a poor labor force sometime in the future as poor achieving students go out into the labor market. And that by historical standards that we see would imply lower growth rates. And of course, lower growth rates are really important in terms of economic outcomes. So what does this mean for the US? Oh, this is the, the picture behind what I just said. Is if you array um, uh, test scores on a horizontal axis against uh, grow, long run growth rates, 1960 to 2000 growth rates, average growth rates of GDP per capita, uh, it's conditional upon what 1960 GDP was. Um, but other than that, it's uh, simply the relationship between test scores internationally and growth rates. You can explain three quarters of the variation in, in long run growth rates with just test scores um, across countries. It yeah. So the economists might object to that. Yeah, yeah, you said I know. Conditional, I think. Slip through that. It is important, especially in our larger discussions, that um, skill is a level effect, and so every bit of common sense is this is going to have a level effect on GDP. Now you grow to get up to the higher levels, but um, you know, okay, it's so not going to make you grow forever at another one percent. Why not? Um, just, so, I mean, I, I, I'll concede this point, that, you know, that whether you look at levels or growth rates, I, this is sort of consistent with endogenous growth kinds of models. And it sort of says that people with a higher skilled, more knowledgeable population invent more things. And so as opposed to you can't keep buying more years of schooling because you run out of age or, or adopt more things if you're not in yeah. the, let's just say it's not obvious that okay. growth is right there are level effects or growth rate effects uh, <laughs> you can really go astray so some of the leading really crazy climate change estimates yes. are because they did exactly this and all you have to do is do the time series model right and it disappears <clears throat> so if if you believe in the level version of this take Two thirds of the net of the estimates I'll give you in the future. That's that's what the difference is. If you believe in level of differences, the next thirty years it doesn't really matter. But how far you extrapolate? I I think the situation is worse than that. <clears throat> that the if you put it into a a, a standard uh, growth model, uh, not endogenous growth, but the growth model that we with the Chad Jones research. The, the people on that side of the table, yes. Okay, I, I agree with that. To get a, 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 a some, something happens favorable, or yeah. say unfavorable in your case, uh, then uh, it's gradually erased uh, as time goes by. Yeah, no, I understand that. So it's not even a level effect. Well, that's why the, the conditional is, has that in it. it. Conditional has a lot, yeah. The, the conditional is is exactly that point. Yeah, that there. About inventions, then you only need to educate the top ten percent and let the wage slaves be. If it's about levels, you okay. need to educate. Okay, them. I I I knew I was going to make a mistake here. <laughs> This is not what I really want to talk about, and I and and I'll defend it separately. This is this is an introductory mistake that I was trying to motivate everything. Um, to, to write this off as Rick 
Rick made an error here of, of introducing something that he didn't want to talk about. <laughs> um, <laughs> How to expect a tough audience. Um, uh, so if I, I'm going to quickly <gasps> um, uh, run through what would happen if you took the observed learning losses in the United States, where we now have data on <clears throat> what were the scores of kids before the pandemic and what were the scores of, of kids after the pandemic or, or mostly after the pandemic, you find that there were huge losses for the US. Um, uh, the estimates I gave you that luckily we were, in, the, the labor economics part of this, which people also would object to, says that this is um, a five to six percent average loss of lifetime earnings for anybody who was in school during the pandemic, basically. Oh, what did labor? Why would you object to that? <clears throat> <laughs> I, I'm not going to discuss this, John. <laughs> this is I'm carrying through to just trying to finish out my mistake because I have slides on my mistake. Okay, <laughs> um, and here's the number of that you would get from the growth rates of the previous uh, estimates, you can use the Hall adjustment of taking two thirds of that number and you get a present value that is um, 10 or more times the total cost of the pandemic on business losses and unemployment and so forth um, in present value terms. So it's- What interest uh, rate did you use for that? Three, three percent. And the important thing from my standpoint is that these losses are permanent unless the schools get better than they were in March of 2020. If we just go back to March of 2020, you're going to have these permanent losses of this cohort that aren't going to be made up for. And so that gets into what I really want to talk about today. Um, Rick, I, just on that score, do we know anything from other tragic national experiments like wars or something mm. what what happened to school kids that were <clears throat> how much was made up if any um the best yes there there are um a series of studies of long-term shutdowns from union uh, uh, activities in different countries argentina colombia belgium uh the best evidence i think is um, from Germany. Um, Germany, uh, after World War II, some of the uh, lander in Germany had a school year that began in January instead of September. And they decided that they wanted to get on the international calendar of, of moving everybody to a September school year. And they did this by having short school years. And so you can pick out a cohort that had the short school years in Germany when they made this adjustment, and you can follow it through the social security data that they are worse than the group right before them and worse than the group right after them in terms of, of what happened because of these short school years. Does it, does it make up for three quarters of a year or? No. It's like half a year. So it's two thirds of the. Yeah. Thing. Okay, great. Um, two thirds of this number is very large. The, the, the two thirds is to, is to translate growth models into level terms as opposed to, to right. endogenous growth so terms. Two thirds of that is still a huge number. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Agree. Um, so. Um, uh, just a, a little quick lead in the way that we've been dealing with the pandemic uh, is um, uh, I don't think we're quite back to where schools were in January of 2020 by all measures. There's all disruption in lots of schools, um, but the most frequently uh, sort of talked about remedial effort is to have more time in the current schools, either lengthen the school day or lengthen the school year. Um, it's, if it's done in a voluntary way, you know that it just expands the um, variations in outcomes because the 
higher achieving kids take advantage of more time and more activities and the lower achieving kids don't. And we have all kinds of, of problems. Um, the Los Angeles school system uh, was going to make up for this by adding four different days to the school year. They did it on a voluntary basis by adding it the first two uh, days of their last Christmas break uh, and at the end of last year about a quarter of the kids actually came to class and you can't imagine what they could possibly do with a random 25% of the population showing up for some extra schooling other than perhaps improve their soccer games. You know, I mean, there's no other way to think of doing that. Um, uh, and we've also seen out of the pandemic a series of negative moves that are, uh, there's been a movement to stop having any testing and accountability in the schools. Um, it's, it's that people have tried to link to the pandemic by saying things like, well, we know kids are worse off. There's no sense testing them to, to find that out. Um, uh, there have been lots of distractions. Um, you will probably notice that nobody in Washington, D.C. has discussed K-12 to policy. We're only interested in loan forgiveness and maybe early childhood education, but there's no discussion at all of K to 12 policies. And then we have things like um, union actions in Oakland. We had an eight day strike last May in Oakland that they had already settled all the pay and benefits issues and the questions were whether we have reparations in Oakland, whether we have um, sustainable plantings around all the schools and whether there are water coolers in all the schools. Oh, and, and housing homeless kids in the schools. Um, and so in the midst of having these learning losses, the unions thought that it was important to to stop schooling for eight days. Yeah, there's also I'm aware of California the um, gutting the curriculum. Al we can't do algebra anymore. Is that just California's nettiness? Or yeah, else yeah, nettiness? yeah. That's that's more California's, which is the leader. California <clears throat> has, even though California is in the bottom third of the nation in terms of performance, um, people pay attention to California, at least textbook manufacturers do, because it's got a, an eighth of the US student population in California schools. Okay, that that's all. Um, uh, we're going to say that I'm going to say that um, schools have to get better. And that the only way that we really know how to do this is by trying to affect uh, teacher quality. That's the only persuasive policy instrument that we can think of. Um, people who have talked about poli uh, teacher policies have generally put it in terms of, well, let's have just more teachers, uh, reduce class size, and so forth. On the teacher quality thing, I've read about things like directed directed instruction, you know, take teachers who aren't very good and say, here's yeah. exactly what you're doing, and that's supposed to make things better. Are there and also great teachers and a bad curriculum yeah. can't be wonderful. Um, so I, I, um, I'm not a big curriculum kind of person. I think it does have an influence in it. And in, in, at least when you do stupid things the way California does, it, it has to have some negative influence. Um, uh, there is evidence on direct instruction, which is uh, people uh, revolt against because it doesn't allow teachers to have do what they do and so forth. Um, it's worked dramatically in developing countries um, where there have been dramatic improvements with direct instruction where you can get actually the, the right level of instruction into the classroom. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to uh, assert for the most part uh, which is something I pretty closely believe that some people are good at this teaching and some people aren't, and that we have to have a selection process that allows us to have the people that are good at it do more teaching and the people that aren't good at it do less teaching. 
Um, and that's what this Dallas story is about. Um, my simple solution um, is along these lines for um, the pandemic, and I'm going to turn to Dallas in one click here, but uh, uh, use the more effective teachers more intensively. Just have it provide incentives to have effective teachers teach larger classes, um, and then use the ineffective teachers less intensively, either um, as a second best solution, give them smaller classes. As a first best solution, get rid of them. Um, uh, and uh, this this is an idea that has not caught on relative to lengthening the school day and the school year. But I'm going to give you some evidence that uh, potentially these are policies that pay off. Yeah. You have to be careful about the incentives there. I was just joking about referees. If you do a good referee report, you get more requests. So, so you want to be careful about the incentive system for quality. Oh yeah, no, no. But I, I pay them more. I give them larger. I pay them more. I would give them less effective teachers to do all the grading and administrative things. I would do a variety of other things to induce um, good teachers to do more. Um, and, you know, most of the evidence suggests that uh, any reasonable changes in class size are, aren't going to offset the difference in quality of teaching. Um, um, so Dallas, let me talk about Dallas. Um, Dallas had a set of reforms that began in 2013. Um, uh, there's a couple underlying papers, this one of them, which was distributed. The first one was distributed. Uh, I think um, there are a couple bureau papers um, and I'm gonna talk about both of them today um, and give you the overview of them. Um, what happened was that Dallas introduced really comprehensive reforms in the way they evaluated teachers and paid teachers and ultimately in how they employed teachers around the district. Um, there was something called the Principal Excellence Initiative that was put together in 2012-13 and then subsequently the Teacher uh, Excellent Initiative that uh, did a similar thing in 2014-15. <clears throat> what they did was to put in an entirely new set of evaluation uh, rules, structure for the system where they had supervisory ratings of all the people. If there were test scores and achievement data, they used those data to get value-added measures of uh, teachers and combine that. They had survey information from the kids and the parents uh, that entered into <laughs> all of this. Um, and there was some use of aggregate school performance. So the, how did the whole school do uh, as a collection that went into it? <clears throat> what they did was pay base pay on the evaluation. So historically, pay for teachers um, has been uh, how, how much experience do you have and do you have in a graduate degree? And it's a lookup matrix and you look up uh, how, what the pay is for anybody. Dallas did away with that entire system. There, there are no remnants of it. There's a little phase in uh, that went on, but they went entirely to pay according to the evaluations that people had. Um, and later, um, the second paper that we'll talk about here um, links the, um, provides incentives for better teachers to work in worse schools. Um, and so they used the whole thing. Now, what happened here was that you take the teachers- hey, hey, and you, for one second. You want to say a word about how they were able to get this done? 
This is kind of stunning relative to most um, of the, the basic idea of unions prevent any change. Sure. I think it's radical. Sure. So I wanted to track um, and talk about the results, but if you could just send a, a minute or two on how that was done. Yeah, I was going to come back to that at the end, but I'll do it now. <clears throat> there um, was a superintendent who had done a similar thing in a small district in Colorado. His name was Mike Miles, and he came and worked with the school board. Um, he while he was there, had a favorable um, draw on the school board um, that would a majority would listen to him. Texas has no collective bargaining. That's not to say that they don't have unions. They have unions that are very active. But um, he spent a couple years uh, trying to convince the Dallas school board that they should adopt these programs and a majority of the school board voted with them. There were some who didn't want it. Um, uh, he got this all in place um, after this long elaborate process. And just as the teacher program was going into effect, he quit and then had enough of dealing with uh, the school board, which uh, in Dallas, the school board is sort of on a knife edge of whether it's something reform oriented or, or not, and so forth. Um, and he got a good draw and, and managed to get this through. Having said that, when he got it through, um, it stuck, even as he left, because <clears throat> Among other things, it was hard to go back to the old system. <clears throat> it wasn't just an add-on to the old system and a bonus that you get, but in fact, it was an entirely different system. And, and he had this clever idea that um, he would have a teacher advisory council that was clearly, it made sense to make it up with the most effective teachers. But if you think for a minute, the most effective teachers are the ones that are least interested in going back to the old system. Um, and it's managed to stay pretty much in effect. Great. All of these things get watered down. Um, the, the punchline at the end that I'll, I'll tell you now is that last May, uh, the Texas Education Agency, the State Department of Education, took over the Houston School District um, after a long involved legal battle. And Mike Miles was appointed to be the superintendent in Houston, where he is now. Um, and there is some hope because he, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to that at the end, but he's trying to put this similar system in place uh, very rapidly in Houston. So there might be two districts in the country. Why did the teachers unions dominated by people with lots of experience, lots of phony baloney degrees and high salaries not immediately go out on strike over this? Well, they wanted to get paid. <laughs> the, um, the, the contract changed. The contract changed. There was a there was a um, uh, phase in that it meant that nobody actually lost money uh, from the old system, and um, it went into place. And then there was nothing to go back to. Um, so there's no collective bargain. Somehow there's a union, but not collective bargaining. Well, anybody can, it, there's a private tennis club here too. I mean, they, they can join a union. It has an influence because it's louder and, and noisier than other places, but it does not enter into directly into collective bargaining in, in Texas at all. The contract is written by the school board and yeah. you as a teacher can take it or go work yeah. at McDonald's. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. obviously this is, there's a political uh, activities behind the scene that, um, but yes. So you said this was not budget neutral, I take it. If, um, because everybody got as much in the new system as in the old system. It was not budget neutral and I don't remember how they, uh, maybe the school board 
but it's some extra money for it. Oh, um, well, it'd be nice to know how much. Well, I, I would come back to that. Uh, let me come back to that at the end because there, Texas is, is as a state trying to promote ideas like this by providing state funds to support uh, these systems. Um, so everybody, everybody is divided into seven categories um, from unsatisfactory to uh, broad mill, progressing means that you, you actually need some help, uh, proficient and exemplary. Um, and you, I mean, there are rules that you can't move more than one category in a year or something and, and yeah. you don't get dropped down unless you have two years of, of poor performance and so forth. Uh, but this determines salaries, um, where you are. These were um, in, in your budget neutral point, Ken. Um, these were fixed size categories. Um, one of the things that you find in US uh, school evaluations is that 94.3% of the people are good. And uh, there's a very small number that aren't. Well, this has fixed proportions in each of these categories. <clears throat> they haven't quite worked out the dynamics of that, right? If, if you start getting rid of poorer teachers right. and get more, then I don't think that they completely understand that yet. What's the distribution across these categories? Um, uh, do I have that? I'll show it to you in in the schools we're looking at. I don't have. I don't think I have it for the whole state. Um, but, you know, there are very few in the exemplary category. There's lots in the various proficient categories, and some in progressive. Um, you know, you you could address this later, but I'm curious. Uh, what is the impact uh, of uh, unsatisfactory or low or uh, quality teacher leaving the district? Uh, because well, I think you know, this is what, what's happening in, you know, in badly run district, what you see is people leaving uh, and going to a better district. Uh, <clears throat> and I wonder whether here you have also an inflow of better quality teachers and some of the effect uh, is driven by that. So I, th I think there is a movement to get better quality in, partly because you can get higher pay. Um, it's Houston that I'll come back to at the end that, that Mike Miles is trying to institute this system is one of the few school districts in the country today that has no vacancies um, as, it, as it went into this school year. It had 30, 30 vacancies in uh, mid-August um, for a school district that has 200,000 kids and I don't know how many teachers. So um, there are with more money and with uh, the promise of being rewarded for your performance, you get people that are willing to come in. Um, now, they don't explicitly fire unsatisfactory teachers, um, which is different than the only other big system that has something like this is Washington, D.C., um, which is somewhat different. It's built on big, big bonuses or big changes in base pay for the best teachers in Washington, D.C. and firing the worst teachers. And they fired five or 600 teachers in Washington, D.C. Uh, based on performance. That was not part of this system, although you, if you're unsatisfactory, you can't expect uh, a lot of income and increases in the future. So you get more people to leave. Are you going to tell us the, the show us the compensation effects of these different categories? Of course I am. Of course I am. That's the whole purpose of this. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you the uh, the uh, impact on students. Of no, no, no. This is this is a design question. What what's the ratio of? Uh, oh I've, no, I'm not going to show you that. I don't have that. Give us any sense. I mean, is it like? <laughs> a question over here, uh, Rick. Um, if you're unsatisfactory for two years in a row, you're still allowed to teach. I think so. 
I think so. The poor kids that get lumbered with those, why don't they have them sharpened pencils or something? It's ridiculous that they're still teaching kids. This is the United States, Nick. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, this is the United States. You can't fire people just because they're incompetent. Um, and uh, that happens all over the place, right? I mean, I mean it really does. That there's very few, there are very few dismissals for poor performance. Um, there are some, but not, not a huge number. Is this really... It works in the sense if you're three years, you know, you're 28 years old and you get exemplary, you're the highest paid teacher around, you've been there for 30 years and you get a progressing yeah. or proficient rating, you're going to get paid. So there's no age, you know, every other business is kind of an age earnings profile, but is it really just great or does the ratings kind of start? No, in the, in the phase in there is an age, you'll see an age component, but in the end system, there is not. Um, because the rating does depend on it's a supervisor's assessment, so no, sure. And and there's there are rules about you know a new uh, a brand new uh, teacher enters as a progressing something, and it, there are rules on how quickly you can move from up in categories. And to be an exemplary teacher, there are a bunch of different hurdles, but you can move up over time. Okay, got it. Um, and what, what are the weights on the different, uh, like the teachers are evaluated by a supervisor and they're, you know, students write about them, parents write about them, they look, there's test scores, uh, you know, are they teaching to the test or? Um, so I think that if not everybody has test scores that can be used to measure their performance. The, um, for those that do have test scores, uh, which in Washington, D.C. is about a, a quarter of the kids in Washington, uh, of the teachers in Washington, D.C. can be evaluated by test scores. Um, I think it's more in Dallas because they developed some new tests that were available. I think if you have both um, observational ratings and test scores that are they're about evenly split if you don't the observational ratings are the most they include things like um 10 to 12 uh random uh observations of teachers for at least 15 minutes over the year and uh one or two longer observational uh, meetings and they're highly structured. The observational ratings are are a bit structured on what's going on in the classroom and what people are doing. Um, and so I th and I think that there's there's pretty good evidence that those are quite closely related to student performance. The the evaluations. So it's not just I walk in and and uh, say Bob, you're not doing a good job, and walk out. Um, it's that I have to record that over <laughs> multiple times. But it isn't just about the weights, because if some of the inputs, for example, have much more variability than others, yeah. then because they're forced into buckets, the source of that variability is yeah. going to be the source yeah. of the ranking. Yeah, so I haven't actually looked at that, and I don't think anybody has, but, but you're absolutely right um, about that. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt again, Rick. I'm still stuck on this. Um, is this transparent? I mean, what, are these rankings known so the parents know that they've got the person who was <laughs> ranked unsatisfactory? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. This, this, this is public information. It is. It's, it's it is actually. public information. Um, I'll come back to that. In, in Texas, um, the commissioner in Texas uh, was actually on the school board in Dallas before he was commissioner and likes this system and has put in place a, 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 a variant of this from the state level of incentives for it. And his idea is, is exactly <clears throat> trying to get a better market for teachers and, and effective teachers by this be, information becoming public and people perhaps bidding for good teachers um, and maybe even parents revolting about bad teachers, heavens. 
Um, uh, okay, we've got that. Um, so let me talk about uh, evaluating the overall impacts first on Dallas, and then I'm going to talk about the specific applications to uh, supporting difficult schools. Um, so the um, the problem, of course, is that uh, the reforms apply to the whole district, and it's a little bit hard to know exactly how to evaluate that. Um, we're going to rely up, upon the magic of synthetic control groups to try to uh, develop a comparison group for Dallas and to see what happened. Um, what, what we're going to do is try to match all of the schools in Dallas to schools in um, the other, the 20 other high poverty big districts um, in, uh, in the state of Texas. And we're going to try to have a control group for Dallas that is made up of uh, a composite of schools in other large urban districts um, as seen in 2013. Um, 2013 is kind of important because um, uh, <clears throat> we're going to, the, the teacher, uh, the principal system comes into effect in 2014 and the teachers in 2015. Um, and so we're going to try to get a control group before this really comes into effect. And then I'm going to try to convince you that the control group is reasonable by looking at the transition period between 2013 and 2015. Um, What's the principal system? Is it the principal system also? Yeah, there's a principal system that is, is almost exactly the same, is that there are rating categories for principals and they get paid different amounts. Um, that um, went first. It, 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 as far as we can tell, that went into effect a year before, which was a good thing because you got presumably better teacher uh, principals there, but they can't do much if they can't control who's in their schools and what their their schools look like. I had a question over here. So I assume Dallas is like other big cities and it's a low performing <coughs> yeah. um, district overall. Yes. Yes, uh, and I'll show you that in just a second. Um, Dallas, uh, so everything I do is going to use the state testing system, which changed a little bit over this time period, but I don't think that affects our results. But um, on average, Dallas is about um, 0.3 standard deviations below the state average beforehand in all and the other our, our synthetic control group is 0.3 standard deviations below. 0.3 standard deviations is a pretty big number for the average of the school district. Um, what does that translate to? That's like years of skill attainment. Because I don't know what. what, what um, so the, the, the rule of the rule of thumb is that one standard deviation of performance is three to four years of schooling. Um, so, so this is like a year of schooling difference for um, on average of every kid in its district compared to the rest of the state. And for, so take kids at the same age schooling level, they're a year behind in terms of learning um, in Dallas compared to the rest of the state. So what, do, what we find is that before things come into effect in 2015, basically when the teacher program kicks in, um, the pre-trend that we have in um, 2013 and 2014, uh, which wasn't used in, in creating this synthetic control group, uh, looks the same. Um, and there's statistical tests. I'm not going to provide any of the uh, gory statistical details behind this. Um, I'm going to give you the answers, and we can go into them if you want. Um, but here's here's the picture. Yes. Is there any experimentation with charters or anything at that 
like that happening at this time period? With yeah. charters? Yeah, charters are coming into effect uh, throughout Texas over this entire period. There are quite a few charters in Dallas and in Texas. Texas is, is a fairly large charter state. Um, we don't have anything that would indicate that there's any real interactions uh, between the charters and this. But we haven't we haven't looked in very de much detail at that. Okay. I have one quick design question. I was curious um, whether you considered using regression discontinuity based on the bins of ratings and teachers proximate to thresholds that created incentive uh, or salary differences. Um, so we, I don't think we have their performance data before, Tom. Uh, the, uh, the, um, we haven't done that, um, which is, is a possibility, I guess. I don't think there's anything on that. I don't think it quite gives you the same full average treatment effect of interest, but it speaks to the theory of change yeah. because it leverages the Correct. contrast. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and so I don't know if we can follow teachers all before the rating system and into it. And it, it it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, so here's the answer. Um, this is math scores of uh, math achievement. And what you see is years beforehand, the there must be some difference here. The, the black um, uh, dots the, are Dallas uh, Independent School District, Dallas ISD. Um, and the red dots and lines are the synthetic control group. And what you see is that uh, before 2015, we, we've got a control group that tracks this. And then we let the system rip after 2015. And what you see is that um, the control group stays at roughly 0.3 standard deviations below the state average. I think that is what's on the vertical axis. And um, the Dallas system goes to about 0.08 standard deviations below the state average so that within uh, four years, the one of the work poorer districts in the state is starting to approach the state average by this uh, change in the uh, pay system. This looks almost too good to be true in the pre-trend. Why, since it's, you know, separate school districts, 2007, what, did we just have a, you know, a year worth of dummies or why in the world would schools across the state, it means it's a signal, not noise, that it's happening to both. So what, um, schools are changing in all kinds of ways. There was something called the 2008 recession too. I don't know if that, if that doesn't quite work out. Um, there are policies that are changing across the state and within districts all the time. So the synthetic control group is trying to uh, to find a group of schools that mimic the performance in our uh, our schools in Dallas, uh, but that would pick up any gross changes like changes in the testing system, changes in the accountability system, changes in the in the spending and so forth. So that we have sort of artificially through 2012 created a, a control group that is matching the what would happen. So if you look at, at test data for the entire US over time, you see some jumpiness, even though there are um, <clears throat> 100,000 kids taking the test there's some is the comparison point a fixed object or is it also changing year to year um the the comparison point when, is, when you say they're 0.3 standard deviations below is that below something that's fixed over it's time below it it's below no it's below the state average in that year, that year. Oh, okay. so we've we've normalized all the tests to the 
state average for the particular year. And so the, the, there is a lot, I mean, at least in the data that I use for Florida, there is a lot of change uh, across years because they changed the nature of these tests. Yeah, sure. So part of it could be explained by that. Um, that's, that's going on in the background, yeah. Okay. yeah. What, what, what fraction of all of the children in Texas are in Dallas? And the reason I ask is to the extent that the Dallas scores go up, that will affect the state average. So in some ways you're, you're uh, weighting it against uh, Dallas. This is my adding up idea from last week. <laughs> um, Relative. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm bringing this up. There are, there are 130,000 kids in Dallas, and I am remembering, and this is this is memory of two or three million kids in the state. So that Dallas is a big state, and it has lots of big districts and so forth. Um, so I don't think that that's driving much. Fred wouldn't be affected by that anyway. Right. Eric, uh, I'm, I'm curious, and maybe you're going to go there. This is related to the question before. So in principle, this, this effect could be driven by two mechanisms. The first one is uh, teachers somehow start working harder. So if you think about developing world, uh, the, you know, in the past, you know, the student, the, the teacher wouldn't show up. Huh? Yeah, the fact yeah. that they show up, huh? you know, the rating are going to go higher or teacher move in and out of different quality. So you could separate the two if you have the teacher fix effect, which so I think we, is- We tried to do that to some extent. And what we find is about a third of this difference looks like it's the composition of teachers and two thirds is something else. But Paul has a good <laughs> point. Just the rating isn't doing this. It means something was done with that rating that I, that yeah, yeah, sure. Jim, where I guess we're getting to. Yeah, well, to we're at this is it <laughs> in in the sense that here's the outcome. I'm I'm going to talk about using the um, this rating system to assign provide incentives and assign teachers to bad schools in a minute. But, but they must you must have done something with it to. Uh, if you just rate the teachers and well, I mean, to what they to, to, what um, if you talk to Mike Miles, he would say it's a it's a whole combination of this the system of providing um, support for individual teachers, better leadership of the principals, mm -hmm. some use of more standardized curriculum and so forth. Um, uh, what it, Mike Miles speaks in larger pictures and it's hard to actually <clears throat> separate this out into individual components. Um, he, let, me, let me come back at the end and talk about Houston um, because that has some interesting parts. Are you going to break this down by type of school or type of student? Do you have the data that allow you to do that? Um, they, no, I'm not going what to do that. type of performance? Hmm? Math's only one measure. Um, not true. Here's reading. <laughs> and reading is in, um, in every evaluation of anything in schools, reading performance is less affected by schools than math performance. Oh. And that's what you find here. You find the same pattern, but it's muted. Um, that uh, the same analysis suggests that this system had an effect on reading too. But if, is there evidence that moving a good teacher from a good school to a bad school has a positive net effect? That seems to be the motivation behind the incentive program. I, He's not a shill. I didn't. I didn't give him this question. No. Uh, <laughs> um, let me talk about accelerating uh, campus excellence or the ACE program, which is designed to do exactly uh, what your question says. Um, with this system, there were two concerns that the leadership of the district had. One was it might be higher, harder to get a good evaluation in a crummy school. And secondly, we were worried about crummy schools. 
and wanted to fix them. So what they did was develop a program that starts a, a year after the uh, overall teacher evaluation system went into effect that um, <clears throat> took, well, four elementary schools in ACE one, there's gonna be two different ACE programs uh, uh, that are there. Uh, one of the schools was identified as cheating on test scores in an earlier period. So we dropped that from the analysis. Um, it turns out not to make much difference if we included it or not. Um, but, you know, it's not good to have cheating schools in your analysis. <laughs> um, uh, and um, what the ACE program, uh, the, the ACE, there was a second version of this later on um, that they were concerned about. The ACE one program was the bottom, the very bottom uh, ranked schools in the district. The ACE two was essentially the second from the bottom schools in the district in a, in a subsequent program that came into effect later. Um, what they did was the following. First, they assigned an effective teacher to each of these crummy schools. Um, I, I should say poor performing schools where we're broadcasting here. Um, the, the, each of these low performing schools got a new principal. None of the existing teachers in these bad schools could automatically stay in these schools. They had to reapply if they were interested in staying. Um, they were paid bonuses based upon their prior rating, effectiveness rating on the system. Um, and there was a little bit of extra money for other things, but most of the money went for personnel. Uh, and this is back to Ken's point about whether it's neutral, cost neutral or not. Can, can you give us the sense of what the percentage of, uh, what, what, how big the incentive had to be to move to a harder school? Yes, thank you. There's, I didn't set this question up either, you know, that's it. Um, thank, thanks to my colleagues for asking the right questions at the right time. Um, Two thousand dollars signing bonus to anybody who would go there. Um, the principal got an annual stipend of thirteen thousand dollars. The um, teachers, um, and this is the the part that's unique to Dallas. The teachers got different amounts of annual stipends depending upon their prior rating. So that um, the best got $10,000 annual stipend, um, middle uh, got 8,000 and lower got 6,000. Now what this does is contrast very dramatically with the um, way that schools have dealt with underperforming schools in the past. In the past, they have said, oh, we have trouble getting people into our schools. We will give a $5,000 bonus to anybody who wants to teach in this poor school. Um, my general economic principle that's applied here is that bad teachers like more money as much as good teachers. And so you end up with, um, on average, the same mix of teachers going into these bad schools as was there before or within the district. And uh, historically, anytime they put on combat pay or extra pay for uh, the poor schools, the results have indicated nothing happens. Uh, not completely the case. <laughs> not completely. Also, good, good teachers like to teach good students. So actually, I, I would guess there would be a negative uh, yeah. selection in that direction. And in safe environments. Sure. They, so, they, I mean, historically, what's happened is that in many school districts, um, you have a right to select your school based upon your seniority. Um, and the more senior teachers find it's easier to teach in high performing schools and they migrate to high performing schools. The low performing schools get all the new teachers because they have no choice. 
And um, then historically, nothing happens other than you maintain the historic differences in performance of kids. Rick, what are ballpark um, average salaries? 50, 60, 70? Um, they're, um, they're mid, they're about 60,000 at this time. So, um, depending on your objective, it's not obvious this is right. So suppose you want to raise the average test score in the district, you might want to match the good teachers with the really good students. Yes, yeah. so you would if in New York, putting the worst possible teachers in Stuyvesant High School might not be the smartest thing. That, that's that's why I, I said that the goals of this school district leadership were twofold. One is um, trying to um, make sure that the system was fair and secondly was to being able to deal with the worst schools i mean that that, that is a, a design issue that i think we could have a good open discussion about at the end um because if if nobody leaves or comes into the system this is really zero sum and um, what you've done is dealt with the poorest performing, but at the cost of elsewhere in the system. Do you know anything about value added by, by good teachers, by type of student? Um, I mean, do they just get out of the way of good students? No, I don't think. Or is it proportional or what? I don't think that there's much. I mean, the, the idea of value adders is to try to get estimates that are independent of the background of students. And I don't think that the normal measures of estimates of these are very closely related to the backgrounds of, of kids. So we don't know much about the point John's getting at. Um, no, no, I, I, I think you, if you believe what I just said, we know a lot about what John just said. If you want to to maximize the the impact on the schools and in fact, uh, good kids will do better with a good teacher, um, then you reassign your best teachers to the highest performing kids. Um, but, 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 but maybe uh, the the good kids don't need such a good teacher because uh, you know, well, I mean, like, I think uh, in the U S they do know. when we're 31st in the world in, in math performance, the, the teacher who knows calculus, sending that teacher down right. to, yeah, a, no, no, I, I agree. Waste. And then, you know, even I needed a teacher the, in, the, in the, in the Florida, um, public data, it was forbidden by us, I mean, by the Florida uh, Department of Education to calculate value added. It was really, I mean, we could get the data, but we couldn't calculate it. So I think it's, the answer is, we don't know. So, well, I mean, it's worse than that. No, by, by background of students. This is, this is a policy decision in California where it is illegal yeah. to relate any teacher yeah. to any student, <laughs> student performance. Uh, there's also the selection question, to the extent that you ruin your, your top end high schools, those kids leave the public schools. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no I, I, I'm not uh, saying that this is necessarily the, the right objective function we ought to be following, or we might follow different ones. What I'm trying to say is that um, first, Dallas objective function was to try to deal with their uh, poorest performing schools. And um, so this was a, a system designed to try to deal with the very rock bottom of their schools. Um, and what I'm going to show you is that it did. Okay. Now you mentioned, people have mentioned the word background. Now we do know backgrounds of students. We know that you have, you have data in the background. We know that those factors are extremely important in in uh, performance. Yeah. And so when you talk about a school being high performing, um, perhaps it's just that the kids are all from backgrounds where you expect them to be high performing. That's uh, that's kind of like a value added thing. But you're you're all of this discussion assumes that uh, that this uh -huh that what you're seeing here is a value added or not value added as opposed to- No, 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 it, this is, uh, at this point, the, choosing the schools is not value added in any sense. No, but in terms of your analysis of, you're talking about a poor performing school and a high performing school, 
And um, but you're not in your for in your level, evaluation. I'm not. Uh, so not right now, I'm not saying anything about value added. Yeah, I'm no. saying that we chose schools on their lowest performance yeah. and historically doing the worst and and looked at see whether we could change that yeah. by an incentive structure and the assumption is that uh, no students the student population didn't move so you you're pretty yeah, yeah. You, you're pretty safe there yeah right. well and we verified that yeah. actually that that this wouldn't the results we got are not a function of families moving in and out of these uh, schools. Um, we know that. Are we going to see the results of this? Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to get there, but I have to. <laughs> I have to deal with my um, inquisitive colleagues. Um, uh, so here's here's the story of. On the left hand side are the ACE one schools, the ones where these incentives were provided. The blue lines are the distribution of teachers across categories in 2015, right before ACE went into effect. And the red lines are um, what happens after the incentives are provided. And so what you see is that um, the red and blue districts are largely non-overlapping. And it says teachers respond to incentives, which is, is something that um, has been debated in the education world of whether <laughs> teachers respond to incentives, but they do. Um, the right hand side is, is our control group, which, oh, the control group, by the way, for this study is the 15% um, uh, uh, next highest achieving schools in terms of levels. So it, it's, we take the, the lowest for ACE program, and then the next 15%, their performance is the control group here. And in the control group, you see that um, before ACE and after ACE, nothing happened. They don't have very many on the right side of the distribution of the exemplary and high proficiency categories, um, and they don't change. That's really surprising. I would have expected them to leave the next highest. Where did they You're come in a semi bad school. Those are the ones are going to go to advanced. Yeah, no, we're talking about 2% of the total population here, uh, of the total school teacher population. And so it's not, a, it's not enough to, to swing the so remaining just the adding up constraint those, those guys on the right hand side there's an adding up constraint that that is true that what i said before i and i believe is that it's zero sum for the whole district but you don't see it in specific schools because it's a small part of specific schools okay so this is what happens you give what is the, the change on ace one it seems to be changed from what well, what happens in ace one is you go from having all unsatisfactory and progressing teachers and low categories of the lowest categories of proficient to having higher proficiency <laughs> teachers and um in the highest groups and exemplary so you this is just a frequency distribution of the uh teachers in the before and after ACE. And so nothing happens in non-ACE schools that you can detect, um, but that in ACE schools, they move, okay? And so what happens? Uh, this is ACE 2, um, which is the same thing, that same sort of structure of having controls that are next group higher, uh, we left out ACE two schools that uh, were going potentially be uh, be a control group for the ACE one schools. We didn't put them in. It doesn't make any difference. Um, uh, and what you <clears throat> see is ACE two schools that came into effect two years later um, had exactly the same result. The uh, teachers responded highly effective teachers by their prior ratings responded. They moved 
to these bad schools. Okay, and so what happened? Here's what happened. <clears throat> this is a diagram that my colleagues made and I should have broken apart, but um, um, I'm gonna to try to walk you through this. This has got both ACE1 and ACE2 schools on it. The uh, circles, um, there are ACE1 schools. The dark circles are the ACE1 schools. The empty circles are the control group for ACE1. And similarly, the darkened diamonds are the ACE2 schools and the open diamonds are the control group. What you'll see is if, if you follow the control group um, across the, um, the all the years from 2012 to 2019, both the control groups for the ACE1 and the, and the ACE2 schools are basically flat. Nothing happens in those schools over over this time. Um, and what you see here is that in the first year of the ACE program, um, scores jump from sort of roughly four tenths of a standard deviation below the city mean here. This is the city mean um, to the city mean. Um, and they remain high. They, they immediately jump when you change the composition as I showed you on the last slide. <clears throat> um, you get the same thing in ACE2 schools. In the first year of ACE2, um, the uh, scores jump. But then <clears throat> partly, partly because of a Judd comment question and partly be, uh, because of not, uh, not thinking it through. In 2019, um, the ACE1 schools had been doing very well, so they were no longer in the category of needing help, and they removed most of the incentives for teachers um, there. It turns out that a large number of the better teachers left um, some going to ACE2 schools, by the way. Um, uh, and what you see is that scores plummet when they take off the incentives, teachers leave, and they start reverting back to their old level of performance. Um, so I, I, I think this, this little picture, I think, you, which you can reproduce in, uh, various regression forms and so forth. Um, this little picture, uh, I think, identifies the fact that incentives matter, that differential incentives matter that are based upon the effectiveness of teachers, um, and that you have the power to take the worst schools based upon family background and everything else and move them up to the, to, the, to the city average if you provide them with good teachers or good, good principles. Too, Very quick, there, there, there's, there's two parts of this and, and one part of it is, not, is less compelling than the other part. The part that's less compelling and maybe you'll persuade me otherwise is the part about how teachers respond to incentives. And what you've really shown us is that some teachers, a small number of teachers relative to the system as a whole, are responding to the incentives. This is the point about these schools only yeah. account for. So is it the case that there was a, a large number of teachers who wanted to transfer into these systems, good teachers, but they weren't able to? Well, or, I don't, or this I don't is... know it. I don't know that story. Yeah. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Um, um, I, I, I'll come back to that a little bit in terms of Houston. I know a little bit about uh, Houston. I have a related uh, question, which is I think for <clears throat> teachers to go into a bad school, I think a great incentive would be that the principal is good. So yeah, yeah. maybe was the crucial aspect of this thing is that, uh, you know, they moved at the time in which, because, you know, if you go to a place which is crazy, I mean, it's just, you're not going to be as effective, right? Uh, so does, I mean, I guess you cannot separate the two, but- uh... that, that is in the background. You're absolutely correct. That you know, the working conditions depend upon the quality of the, of the boss yeah. and, and what the structure set. So yes. 
You had a second. <coughs> second? No, I said the other part of it that is compelling is just the the effect of having good teachers there. That's not okay. subject to the concern I just raised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll come back. The, we don't know the answer to that. Of um, you know, can can you change the entire 130 schools right. in Dallas um, as opposed to just a subset of uh, seven elementary schools that I'm looking at here. There's some middle schools, by the way, that we didn't analyze in the same way. Or we did, but it's harder because of testing. Um, it, so you see the same thing, by the way, in reading, answering John Taylor. Um, it's not just math. You get the, the same increase in first year ACE. You get the second, same increase in second year ACE and you get the same decline when you take off the incentives. Everything's just more muted, muted uh, with reading, um, which is not a surprise when you see any of the performance of schools. So can, can I just, I'm just, these effects are actually huge if I understand them right, because what they say is like, and go to go back to the, well, they, we'll stay here. The first year effect of ACE is erasing a half standard deviation. Yeah. Uh, and that's about, according to your, that's a year and a half of schooling. So let me go back no, no, to the other. It's not that much. Let me go back to the other one where it is close. Yeah. It goes there. Um, close to a half standard deviation. Okay. Yeah. That's that's erasing, and that's that's a year and a half of schooling. According to, you said it earlier, yeah. a standard deviation is about. Yeah. So in just one year, there you're erasing a schooling gap of a year and a half. Bro, yeah. that's an enormous effect. It is enormous. Yeah, it, it's absolutely enormous, and it, it brings these schools up to the um, uh, to the district average, the worst schools, and it brings the entire district of uh, Dallas up to the state average with the whole system. So the, up, the upper schools did not lose. They, um, lose they did the They did not, according to the previous this thing. measure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, it's, it's awfully quick, yes. <laughs> you're talking about, you're always talking about teachers as if that was a, a homogeneous group of people, but math versus reading, we're talking about a different group of teachers. No, they, math, it, no, it, here, no, the, these are elementary schools where they're teaching everything. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. sorry. These are elementary, elementary schools. Elementary. I should, okay. should have made that clear. Yeah. yeah. These are not specialists. Yeah. Okay. Um, so th the more compelling story, I think, is that we then looked um, at, uh, we were looking at performance in grades. Uh, one through five, actually we test them in, it's grade three and five in the previous things where we test kids. They go to middle school in grade six. And the question is, do you see these performance gains holding for grade six after they've left the A schools? And so the um, left-hand side um, is the, um, full distribution of performance of ACE kids versus control kids. Um, uh, controls are the red and ACE are the blue. Um, and then we look in 2019 and you see that this distribution has been systematically across the board move slip to the right. And that this is the longer term effects um, that you see. Now, if you look at just kids that have had one year of ACE from the, and then left, they don't get much of an impact. So what you, see, what you see with the one year, that our interpretation at least, is that it's easier to change the short run test scores than it is the underlying deep, deeper learning. But after two or three years, you see that um, kids have a lasting impact in subsequent performance, um, suggesting that this is not just, you know, teaching to the test or anything, but that they are, in fact, learning things that carry through. Or that teaching to the test is actually useful. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us have, have argued for that test. 
some of us have argued for that, but yes, in terms of general accountability, that if you have a reasonable test, you want them teaching to that test. Part of what they're learning is how to learn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so let me give you some conclusions uh, here, and then we can talk more widely. Um, so I take this as supporting my general uh, um, un, unrecognized policy proposal to improve teacher effectiveness for to deal with the pandemic problem um, that you know teachers respond to incentives and having effective teachers makes a difference uh because we're here what we're seeing here is change the composition of the teaching force nothing about class size or any, anything else and if you get better teachers in you get better performance of the kids um the um uh i think this looks like it's scalable because we have full several full schools that are doing this um we have we have prior evidence i think that uh the washington dc whoops thomas left um uh washington dc uh system has lasting impacts that has improved schooling in washington dc it's still not a very good system but the kids have done better um, and I've given you um, two districts out of 13,500 where, where we do something sensible, what I would call sensible, and get some results. Um, when I wake up optimistic, I think that, well, these are institutions that so we could maybe move someplace else. When I wake up pessimistic, I wonder, you know, are these individuals, you know, <laughs> Michelle Ree fighting in Washington, D.C., and Mike Miles fought, fighting in Dallas, um, or in prior incarnation, Jeb Bush fighting in Florida, where individuals are able to get some changes that uh, when they leave, they sort of stay, but get whittled down over time. Um, and we, we have an, ex I don't know if it's the right experiment. Um, there's Houston because I, as I already told you, Mike Miles stepped out of the Texas schools for a while and then was brought back as superintendent in Houston. And um, uh, this addresses a, a little bit of Steve's question. There were, uh, there's 200 schools in Texas, uh, in Houston. 27 of them were identified as failing, and that gave the possibility to the state commissioner to replace the school board and the, and the superintendent and bring in administration. Um, so Mike Miles came in as superintendent and basically took a variant, it, it's not the exactly the same system, but, but a variant of Dallas and sort of said, here's what we're going to do in these 27 schools. Um, it involved spending more money and, and, um, and did that. Um, and then um, over the summer, he was doing training for the principals in Houston, and he had all the principals together, and, and, and he explained to all the principals what was being done in the 27 schools, and a bunch of other principals said, well, why don't we do that in our school, too? Um, and he said, you know, this is pretty serious stuff. You know, you got to make sure that you're teachers and, and you really want to do this because it's pretty serious, and we're not going to give you all the money that the 27 get. And something, I think it's 53 schools went back to their teachers, got agreement that they should, should change things in these dramatic ways in evaluation and everything. And they joined the system um, in a sort of second category of being in this evaluation system. We don't know any of the answers yet. Um, there's uh, lots of town meetings that 
where people yell at Mike Miles in part because he uh, uh, eliminated 23 librarian positions to arguing in a sort of judge like way that well I you know money isn't available for everything and we have to make some choices um <laughs> He, anything about other states, other areas? Oh, that, let me let me say a little bit more. One more thing about Texas. Texas, three years ago, um, as I said, the current commissioner um, had been from Dallas, and three years ago, the, the Texas legislature passed something called HB three, House Bill three, which, among other things, had a pot of money in it that would give incentives to any school district in Texas that put in place a reasonable accountability system and use that to help bring uh, good teachers into poor schools. Um, this is actually my idea of how you can do this. He didn't say institute the Dallas system or the Houston system. He said, if you can come up with a reasonable system, um, that's based upon your own capacity and your own interest um, will provide the support from outside to, to deal with the Judd budget constraint um, and will help to pay for this, but in part to try to get a, a market for these teachers that would be identified in various school districts <coughs> as good. The money followed the the good teachers, essentially. The, the state would provide more money for the good teachers. And presumably, I, I don't have any actual data on this. If a good teacher leaves San Antonio and goes to some other district, the money presumably follows the teacher so that you have starting to have some sort of pseudo market for teachers and effective teachers. It's going to work. I don't know. It looks to me like a uh, like there's a lot of evidence here that if you do sensible things, it pays off. The Dallas accountability and compensation system, as you described it, I would think would greatly undercut the demand for advanced education degrees for teachers. Hopefully. Hopefully, right, right. So that's so, so you know, part of the institutional, <laughs> Sorry, Eric. Part, part, Eric was, was creating, the institutional uh, barriers aren't just the unions, they're the whole credentialing. Oh, yeah, no, mill no, no. That, that education schools are a part of. I mean, so look at this Dallas, I mean, Texas has a thousand school districts, um, and you have this one Dallas breaking away, they have no collective bargaining, and yet the system it has a lot of inertia in it. it keeps doing what was done before and uh, is there any evidence on what happened to teacher enrollment in dallas yeah it, advanced it appears yeah in, yeah, in yeah programs there's, after this? there's a little bit of evidence that um and there's i think more evidence from washington dc in washington dc you at least got the poor teachers to leave more readily and had uh the best teachers stay around a little bit longer. Um, it's a little bit hard to get comparisons of who is moving in and who's moving out because you don't have uh, measures of their effectiveness before they're in the district. Um, so it's a little bit hard to do that. Um, I think, uh, well, I can keep, do this in two minutes and I won't be attacked for it. Um, the, uh, uh, I think it's really hard to ever guess who's going to be a good teacher before they're in the classroom. And what these systems do is emphasize performance after they're in the in the classroom. Um, I don't know. Well, it, it is a, so you <clears throat> what you're finding is that there's sort of a generalized good teacher. I, I'm actually surprised that somebody who's a good teacher in a fancy school can also be a good teacher. Yeah, that's, that's the evidence that we see. Uh, yeah, we yeah. see that evidence that the people who are good are good. And the other dress, so we, we do, you, you mentioned just public schools, but I'm vaguely aware of the near miraculous uh, 
things that some charter schools, like the Success Academies, yeah. have in New York, where they go into the absolutely yeah. most horrible schools and they turn out kids who are beating state averages, which seems to sort of go further to prove your point. Good teachers can do wonderful things with a very um, uh, with a, a difficult uh, input level. Yeah, and, and you know, yeah. there's no. There, there's no magic system, and that's part of the problem here. Um, like success, success academies has a very scripted curriculum and program, and and they monitor it. Um, and teachers that aren't performing well according to that system don't stay around. Um, but it's hard to put that in place in lots of other places. So what really, what really, really you're showing us is you can get some way in that direction even in a public school system, at least so long as it doesn't have a big yeah. uh, blue city union right. problem. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the that's the message. Um, you know, the discouraging message is I'm talking about two school districts or a handful of school districts out of thirteen thousand. Um, Rick, we have a question online. Yes. Oh, Paul. Hello, yeah. Rick. Yes, hi, Paul. Yeah, so um, I, I, I have a short question, and then depending on the answer, I'll have a longer question. So the short question is, are these the average scores at these schools that you're talking about, or are they the individual level scores of the each student at, at the school? They're the average of the individuals. The average of the individuals at the school level. Yeah. Well, because you're, you know, when you say a standard deviation of 0 0.4, that's a very big number. I mean, in the in the uh, study that Mathematica did of Washington D.C., the total impact was about a, a tenth of a standard deviation. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was over, you know, the whole impact. It wasn't just in one year or anything like that. So mm -hmm. you're getting much bigger impacts here. But I'm wondering if you can really use that same standard deviation, unless you've got population of individuals that you're looking that, at. The that's an individual. He was asking. That's a you... standard deviation of individual scores. That's it's not so average. It's not. The standard deviation of the school average. It's the standard deviation of the individual scores. All right. Well, that's more impressive. I mean, that's truly impressive. So that 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 invites my other question, which is, um, you know, it's very hard to keep that going to scale. I mean, if you go to DC, you've got a whole innovation at scale for the system as a whole. You've got it in a specific set of schools. Almost any innovation um in a pilot kind of setting once you go to scale you lose a lot of uh of the impact so do you have well, any that's, been the, that? that's been the historical comment but here we went from ace one to ace two and got the, exactly the same results so we took we started with our evaluation was three there were four elementary schools and then it went up to eight elementary schools in ace two in ace two and it stayed. Uh, you could reproduce this as you went up. Now, you know, there may be limits to it, but but this is more scalable than almost any other uh, experiment that I know of. Did I hear you correctly? You say you went from three to eight? Um, yeah. Yeah. We oh, went okay. after I we don't have... really see that as scaling, you know. I mean, you're a long ways from being at scale in Dallas. I, I want to, uh, John Taylor had to leave, so I'm going to uh, take his prerogative and call time. And thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Uh, just thank you. Let those want to go, go. <laughs>